Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we pray, we come before you, come before your presence this evening. We thank you for giving us this time to explore our questions and to really come to biblically sound answers for them. Help each one who will be attending today let the inter internet connection be stable and help them to really find the answers to the questions that are inside each one of them. We also especially pray for Pastor Duke during this time. Bless him, fill him with your Holy Spirit, give him your wisdom so that he may answer each and every question according to your word, your ways. We pray for him and we ask that you will bless each and every word so that it will be according to your will and your heart. We bless this time and we commit everything into your hands. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. And yeah, Kevin is joining us from Mumbai. He's a student of engineering, doing engineering. Uh, and he's also one of our uh, keen participants, prize winners in our other event, which also takes place on, on a Wednesday night, not every Wednesday, but on a chosen Wednesday, uh, our Kahot Bible quiz. We have covered a number of Bible books. The next one is in the book of Hebrews. Uh, so welcome to each one of you. We have uh, Kevin, Ruben, Samuel, uh, Priscilla, Paul, Pinolia, Dayakar. Uh, welcome to each one of you. Okay, this is question thirst quench truthfully. So uh, the format is you ask questions. You can type questions or unmute yourself and ask questions. And I will quickly answer them. And then we go to the next question. So question, thirst, quench, truthfully, uh, cutie, cutie, uh, February 2023 edition. All right, who's going to ask first? Go ahead. My uh, question. Yes, Kevin. Yes, Kevin. My question is, yes, if someone is genuinely saved, if they're a genuinely saved believer, mm -hmm. will they be always saved or is there any way that they can lose their salvation? Okay, it's a good question. Um, now, to give you uh, a straight answer, uh, I believe they can lose their salvation, but we do not exactly know from the Bible when they lost it. Or oh, we cannot say, okay, this is the exact second they lost it. So there's no scripture verse that tells you that this exact second they lost it. But on the other hand, uh, when we look at the evidence found in the New Testament, what Jesus said, what the apostles said, uh, we find evidence that ultimately they are lost. Uh, people were once saved, they were ultimately lost. And uh, there are a number of passages that you can look at. And uh, the most powerful ones come, come from the book of Hebrews. Uh, book of Hebrews. And there are two chapters in Hebrews which talk about it. Let me briefly uh, take you to both the chapters and read the relevant scriptures. Uh, Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 4 onwards. It says, it's impossible for those who have been once enlightened. Uh, very clear reference to a believer who have tasted the heavenly gift. Another reference to a believer. Second time, who have shared in the Holy Spirit because nobody can be saved without the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so three phrases used in Hebrews 6, 4 to talk about a person who is saved, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God. Again, a uh, reference to a believer. And the powers of the coming age, powers of the coming age, uh, you know, in the coming age, uh, we will be completely healed. That is, after the return of Jesus, the, the after the second coming, we will be completely healed. I won't need to wear these specs, uh, uh, spectacles. Uh, I don't need to visit a doctor. Uh, I, I won't die. Uh, I won't have to have a tear in my eye if I have a misunderstanding with close members in my family. So no tears, no, no disease. So, but... I've experienced some of it right now. When I was a little boy, uh, I used to have asthma. I prayed for healing and I, I don't have asthma anymore. That doesn't mean I'm not going to die. If the return of Jesus is delayed. I One day Duke Jiraj will be dead. Uh, so I've experienced 
healing, first fruits of healing. Uh, so, uh, and uh, in that sense, I receive blessings that God especially have a, has for a believer in Jesus Christ. Okay. The powers of the, uh, uh, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God, who have, the powers of the age, who have fought and who have fallen away, verse 6-6, six, six, and who have fallen away, people who have backslidden to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God and are subjecting him to public disgrace. So they, this is, uh, these are, again, phrases talking about stubborn backsliding. Okay, people have stubbornly gone away from God. Verse 7, land that drinks the rain often falls on it, produces crop useful for those who are, whom it is uh, farmed, receives the blessing of God. 6, 7, again, uh, the analogy in 7 is, as we read in Isaiah 5 and other passages, the Old Testament repeatedly call, compares God as a vineyard owner and his people as a vineyard. So, and one of the things that God sends to, to bless the vineyard is rain. So God has given you blessing upon blessing, revelation upon revelation, warning after warning. And even after all of that, you still want to stubbornly backslide. What is going to happen to that crop? It says... Uh, but land that produces, that land here refers to a believer, but believer that produces thorns and thistles. That means your life is uh, life is fruitless. Uh, you're still stubborn in sin. Your fruit is actually a thorn and thistle is worthless and is in the danger of being cursed, which means it will be condemned. And in the end, it will be burnt. Again, a clear reference to going to hell. So Hebrews 6, 4 to Eight is talking about a believer ultimately losing his salvation and going to hell if he will be stubborn in sin, if, if, they, if they will not repent. Uh, and then there's another passage in the same uh, book, chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10. And if you read from 26 onwards, uh, these are the two most powerful uh, passages in the New Testament talking about the real danger of losing your salvation ultimately if you are stubborn in sin. Hebrews 10, 26. If we stubbornly keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left. Which means it's not like Jesus' sacrifice is not enough uh, to forgive you, but you don't feel like coming back to Jesus and asking for forgiveness like it happened in the case of Judas. Judas betrayed Jesus, but he never came back to Jesus to ask for forgiveness. Well, Peter did. Peter committed a even graver sin than Judas, but Peter came back, but Judas never came back. So in that sense, no forgiveness, no sacrifice for sins is left. Hebrews 10, 26. But only a fearful expectation of judgment on of the raging fire that consumes the enemies of God. So again, this passage is talking about believers because the word V is used in Hebrews 10, 26. You can see that V. So the author, uh, who could be Priscilla, uh, you know, she includes herself in this warning, which means if Priscilla is a believer, Priscilla is definitely a believer. She's, author, she's an author of a Bible book. And then she includes the believer she's writing to if we deliberately keep on sinning. So if believers keep on deliberately sinning, there will come a point they will not feel like coming back to Jesus for repentance. And in that sense, there is no sacrifice left to, uh, to forgive their sin. And ultimately, they go to a place where they will burn forever and forever, where there's a fearful expectation of the judgment of God, Hebrews 10, 26 and 27. So two clear passages talking about how you can ultimately lose your salvation, even though you're a believer. And there are other passages. Uh, I have written a term paper when I did my I did a course called MDiv, Masters in Divinity, when I was a student of Southern Asia Bible College. It's one of the earliest term papers that I wrote on this very subject, which we publish in our magazine, the Days of Your Youth, I can send you the link for it. It's on our website, dukewords.com. I will cover more references and uh, and I will also uh, do a systematic study, but I'm just giving you this answer straight from God's word uh, from a Bible book, taking two passages. And I hope my answer helped you, Kevin. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us. One of the joys of uh, me having this event event like this is people from various walks of life have joined. Uh, we have uh, Kevin and we have Jaziel joining in. They are students. Uh, we have people who are working, uh, who have joined us. Uh, and uh, 
We praise God for each one of you have joined. Okay, uh, what's who's going to ask the next question? Question, thirst, quench truthfully, live Q&A. Uh, it's, go for it. Yeah, brief answers from the Bible to your questions. Okay, there's a... I can see something in my chat. Uh, okay. Uh, there's a question. Sam has asked everyone, can we evolve from being a Calvinist to an Armenian or vice versa? Why not? It's uh, it's quite possible. And I, as I've already stated in my uh, in my in my in my uh, in these in this forum in QTQT, QT, uh, in question to us, truthfully, uh, the Bible has references for uh, for the Calvinist stand as well as an Armenian stand. So both of them cannot have a holy than thou attitude. But I think we need to. Uh, when the Bible talks about uh, truths that are called Calvinistic, we need to emphasize that. When the Bible talks about truths that are called Armenian, we need to emphasize that. So I think both views can be held and we don't have to feel they are contradicting each other. Um, you know, I was just talking about this in a court poster, which I sent out. Uh, you know, I have uh, uh, one of our volunteers, our ministry, which has now finished 17 years of existence. We are a small ministry, uh, not very famous. Uh, I'm not a church. I, though young people call me pastor, it's okay to call me a pastor, but I'm not a technically a pastor. I'm a traveling evangelist. I'm a traveling Bible teacher. Uh, I'm a uh, I'm a full time counselor. You know, uh, I'm a writer from residence. These are terms that you can use to describe me. Uh, uh, but I'm not a pastor. I don't I'm, I don't run a church. I don't uh, I, I I don't uh, have a congregation. Uh, so that, that's just a, a way of clarification. I was once upon a time a pastor in 2001. I was an Assembly of God pastor in Delhi, worked under uh, the great uh, Assembly of God leader from North in, in North India, uh, Robert Jairaj. I was his assistant and I was a youth pastor. I taught in the Bible college there. And that's a long story. I won't, I won't uh, uh, go there. So what I'm, what I'm saying is, uh, you know, you can... You can be a Calvinist, you can be an Armenian, and you need to understand that there are different scriptures in the Bible talking about both these positions, and they're not necessarily contradicting each other. So I was talking about this poster that I sent out, and this poster says in Isaiah 46.10, the Bible says, God knows they end from the beginning. Okay, Isaiah 46.10. But at the same time, Isaiah 30, 21 says, God is ready to guide us through every step. So there's a voice from behind we will hear, Isaiah 30, 21, saying, this is the way, walk in it. So uh, Calvinists would love to stress only on Isaiah 46 and verse 10. He knows the end from the beginning. But our Armenian would like to say, God uh, and would stress Isaiah 30, 21. God guides every step. God speaks to us. You know, God spoke to me, and that's why I have an event called Question Thirst Quench Truthfully. This idea came to me when I prayed. I believe God guided me to start an event where I don't preach, but we don't have worship, but we'll only have Q&A. And uh, we have been having it for a number of months now, over a year, and I can see uh, uh, we have around 36 videos in our YouTube playlist with uh, recordings from this event. Uh, we must have had uh, at least 30 plus, and then we also have volunteers to chop the answers and we upload them in the same uh, 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 YouTube uh, channel. So at least 25 to 30 different events like this we have had. God led me to do it. I could have disobeyed. I could have said, no, I would stick on to preaching. I'd prepare a message, preach 45 minutes, one hour. But I'm always listening to God because I believe and I'm obeying. I can So I can, just as Duke Jairaj can obey and disobey God when he speaks, uh, any other believer can also do that. So the Armenian stress on that point, that that that's, that aspect, that the need to use our free will to obey God, while the Calvinists stress on the parts that says that God knows the end from the beginning, God knows our steps. So they stress on the God, God passages, God, the, the things that talk about, the passages that talk about God and uh, in, the, the, in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, well, the Armenians talk about man and his responsibility. Both are there in the Bible. So I don't go by uh, labels, uh, and we should also not go by labels. So, uh, so you, uh, I would 
you know the way i speak the way i stress things many people will call me an armenian but i am i'm i'm i believe uh, in many of the things that the calvinists uh, teach as well for example calvinists will teach that you will never lose your salvation I mean, and maybe kevin's question uh, comes when he perhaps read some calvinistic uh, uh, articles or calvinistic preaching and we have a number of churches pastored by calvinistic pastors so i have no problem with those the such a stand as well because a, a calvinist a true calvinist uh, would would say that if you lost your salvation you were never really saved and there are some passages like that i believe i think those passages come from one john you know there are passages which say that if you lose if you live in stubborn sin you're not even a believer in one john you have some passages passages like that but an armenian will say that you lost your salvation it's saying the same thing what i don't agree whom i don't agree with are the hyper grace cultists who say that even if you stubbornly live in sin you will be you are saved you're saved jesus is smiling at you and you will go to heaven or rather some of the ex extreme forms of uh, forms of hyper grace uh, guys hyper supernaturalists they don't even uh, uh, they don't believe in a literal heaven uh, in effect a literal hell uh, uh, they they are talking about uh, a utopia happening here and now where we won't die where we won't have disease and after which jesus will come you know uh, so they are this is really a cult okay so a classical calvinist will say a person is never saved if he is living stubbornly in sin the armenian will say the person who stubbornly in sin was saved based on uh, scripture again i showed you two scriptures from the book of hebrews uh, chapter 6 and chapter 10 and but on the final day of judgment you know he will lose his salvation both are the same uh, both are not supporting stubborn sin both calvinists and armenians are not sub supporting stubborn sin but hyper grace guys they in effect support believers living in stubborn sin by saying even if you are stubborn in sin you will still go to heaven or you are still are you are still in heaven as they however they say it. and there, you are never in danger of going to hell that's what they say and that is why they are a cult and i as a preacher uh, by the grace of god have been fighting them tooth and nail over the last number of years i guess the first sermon against them came in as early as 2013 it's been a decade uh, 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 i i get i've made a lot of enemies because of that no problem i, I can handle that by god's grace but uh, and this fight will continue as long as there's breath in my nostrils till the return of jesus okay thank you uh john killed uh, kill us killed us um uh, if i remember my conversation with him he's in the ministry uh, correct me uh, if you if i'm not if i'm wrong john uh he's live he lives in mumbai what is the teaching of the nicolaitans and which is mentioned in revelation chapter 2 uh we need to look at that passage and read it okay uh a brief response to all of this is you know uh book of revelation uses a number of old testament analogies uh, it assumes the readers have read all the old testament and the old testament is in the tip of the fingers so because it assumes that it's not going to take time to give you a detailed expression uh, uh, explanation about what those phrases mean and because we are not so familiar with the old testament like how the jewish uh, believers original jewish believers were you know that's why we are not able to understand uh, so if you live in india uh, you you immediately you know you, you know it when somebody says uh, delhi because you know where delhi delhi is you know where mumbai is you know where bangalore is you know where chennai is but if you if you were to describe delhi or 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 mumbai or or chennai to a, a north indian uh, or to a american north american then you have to qualify uh, a city in northern india called new delhi a city in western india called mumbai and so on and so forth so the writer of revelation assumes that you are thorough with many of the uh, with the old testament so he uses old testament in analogies without giving an explanation and and uh, that is why a book of revelation will have number of old testament analogies but let's just look at the nicolaitans okay uh chapter i guess they are in chapter 2 
Uh, okay, verse nine. Okay, uh, this I hold against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from your place. Uh, and But you have this in your favor. You practice your practices of the neglectance, which I also hate, which whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, I want you to see that this is a pattern in Jesus' uh, statements to the different churches. Okay, here he talks about uh, the Nicolaitans, Nicolaitans, okay. And then he will talk about uh, Balaam to another church. Okay, Nicolaitans also there in verse 16. Okay, you hold on to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Okay, uh, then uh, you have uh, uh, Jesus warning them against Jezebel, verse 20. Okay, uh, chapter 2, verse 20. And there's also a place where he talks about Balaam, verse 14. Verse 14. Now, all these references we can safely say, are people who brought in false teaching. The details of those false teaching remain hazy. So you need, when the, when, when the, when, when the scripture talks about Nicoltons, when the scripture talks about Balaam, and the scripture talks about Jezebel, uh, you need to understand that these are all false teachers who, who influenced the people of God in the past. Uh, maybe Nicoltons are not there referred to the old, referred in, in, in the Old Testament. But you must understand they are familiar to the original readers and we don't have access to, uh, we don't have sure access to that particular reference. But based on what, uh, what Jesus has said to other churches, like where he warns them against Balaam, what was Balaam's problem? Balaam uh, problem, we read about him in Numbers uh, 22, uh, definitely, uh, that, that, that part of Numbers. Balaam wanted money and he was ready to change his, uh, his, his version of what God said to him based on the money he receives. So we are talking about Jesus warning the church of pastors, uh, prophets, evangelists, apostles, men of God, women of God who would twist scripture for financial gain. So be warned, be wary of them. And then Jezebel, Jezebel ran a Bible college in the Old Testament. What Bible college did she run? She trained youth, hundreds of them. And what was, what did they do? They ended up worshiping Baal. What was Baal's theology? Baal's theology is you go to a Baal temple and there are there are camps around the Baal temple, and there are beautiful girls in those camps, in those in those camps or tents. So you go inside and you have sex with those girls, and Baal watches from heaven, and Baal gets excited, and he sees you having sex with those uh, temple prostitutes, as they were called, uh, you know, and he stimulates himself, and the and he emits a semen, and the semen is actually the rain that we receive. So what do you do if you want rain in the land? And they were all an agricultural economy. They wanted rain. They wanted plenty of rain. So all they had to do was to go to Baal temple and sleep with those prostitutes. And, and Baal will excite himself and, and he will emit semen. And that semen becomes is actually the rain. So this was the Baal theology that, that Jezebel was promoting by training the, by running a Baal Bible college sort of, sort of uh, in, in, in Israel. And that the people of God were spoiled by this theology that made them comfortable in sexual sin. So beware of pastors. Beware of any cult coming inside the church. Beware of any teacher of God's word who makes you comfortable in sin, especially sexual sin. And that is why I warn against hypergrace theology, which makes you comfortable in sin. So that, that's Jezebel. So though we don't have clear reference in the Old Testament about Nicoltons, we can assume they are somewhat like 
the the Balaam, which Revelation chapter two talks about, or Jezebel, they are they are off. They are twisting the word of God to bring in false teaching. So we can safely say that. Uh, so that's my opinion. Though we don't have a reference, but the original readers understood Nicolaitans to be people who twisted God's word to bring in a, a dangerous false false teaching. A, a false teaching so dangerous that will, if you believe in it, you will go to hell. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, uh, comment, uh, John. Got it. Thanks. You know, I'm encouraged. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right. But if you look at a study Bible, you might find uh, uh, more detail. But I'm trying to, you know, in this uh, Q&A, you understand that I do it live. Okay. Uh, God gives me grace to do that. And it, it also, I'm also uh, trying to uh, learn through each episode. Uh, so I'm trying to answer the question so simply without uh, complicating things as much as, as I can. Uh, so that the lay person can understand, so that the ordinary believer can understand. Study Bibles might give you some other background, but I'm trying to take, give the answer straight from the text of scripture. Uh, I believe that uh, that will help you a, a, a lot more than uh, going in depth about background and some of which could be very true, uh, but I'm giving you a simple answer, which will also do no violation to the rest of the New Testament, the rest of the Bible. Okay, yes, who's going to ask the next question? I'm happy to have Summa Sumarishta joining us, medical student from Andhra Pradesh. We have uh, welcome to Shirley. Uh, welcome, Anandraj. Welcome, Brother Chandrasega. Okay, yes. Brother, uh, praise the Lord. Chandrasekhar, yeah. Yeah, praise I Lord. have a, it's been like, a uh, long time ago, I made note of this question, but I didn't join in this way in these months. Okay. The question is from Psalms 122, verse 6. Okay. Psalms 122. Okay, go ahead. Verse 6. Uh -huh. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May mm. they prosper who love you. Mm. I have often seen many preachers, pastors, you know, picking up this verse mm. and directing people, irrespective of what is happening in Jerusalem. Mm. They say that to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and love mm. Jerusalem, then you will be prospered. You mm. should have a burden for Jerusalem. It's mm. more of, uh, you know, the, the things that's happening in Jerusalem uh, for mm. a quite long time, right? The war and uh, other conflicts. Yes. Uh, the Christian community or these preachers are, looks like triggering the people towards in favor of Jerusalem. So mm. is this right? Or what is the definition of this particular verse? Okay. Now, I want to uh, tell you uh, uh, my stand in this, okay, and this also is a, a controversial stand I've taken and I've received a lot of hate messages from the group that, uh, that focuses on this. Um, I believe, I believe, uh, based on my understanding of the New Testament, that the church of Jesus Christ has replaced Israel. And if you read the New Testament, very carefully, without any bias, you'll also come to the same conclusion. Uh, while you know the, the Bible uh, talks about Israel and God's blessings to Israel, right in the Old Testament, it's very clear, as we see in Genesis chapter 12, why did God choose Abraham? So that he will be a blessing to the entire world. And uh, so that God will multiply them as sand of the seashore, and they will be a blessing to the world. And so that is what is there throughout Genesis, and then as the, as the scripture picks up, you know, uh, the, the Isaiah, you know, where we have the great commission of the Old Testament in Isaiah, you know, uh, where we read the, the, that Israel was called to be a light unto the Gentiles, and Exodus, uh, a, a priest for the nations, not just for them themselves, for the nations. So the missionary thrust of the Bible, where God says, I'm going to, you know, Give my give a special my special revelation to the Jews, and the culmination of the special revelation is Jesus, and they are going to be missionaries to the ends of the earth. And then on the day of the Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes, and the the church is born. And again, uh, people from different parts of the world come, and Jews from the different parts of the world come, and then uh, God and the church, which is predominantly Jewish, becomes Gentile. 
uh, we see the story of Cornelius getting saved and uh, and how Paul went traveled and preached the gospel uh, all the way to Irlikum, which was modern Yugoslavia, and preaching to so many Gentiles. And then by the time they write the letters, they make it very clear. Uh, and this is very clear, clearly made by Jesus as well as the apostles. That our focus in right now should not be on national Israel, but on spiritual Israel. And who's spiritual Israel? Kevin Suvarna, Priscilla Paul, Diakar, Suma, okay, uh, Shirley, Chandrasekhar, Jaziel, John Clitus, Vinolia, Sam, Sam, Reuben. So we are the spiritual Israel. Our focus should be on. Uh, and even if a Jewish man becomes a believer, he becomes also spiritual Israel. It's not like God hates the uh, 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 a man who is born in Israel. He doesn't care where you're born. That's why we have verses. There's no Jew, no Greek. You're all one in Christ Jesus. Okay, but let me read what Jesus said, which is often not uh, talked about. And uh, that is Matthew chapter 21 and verse 43. Uh, Matthew chapter 21 and verse 43. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you. He's talking to the uh, Jewish crowd there. Matthew 21 and verse 43. Jesus says, one day because of you Jews were stubborn and uh, they were stiff-necked. Jesus says to them, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. So this verse is talking about how the church predominantly will become Gentile because the Jewish people rejected it. And Jesus says, the kingdom of God will be taken from you, national Israel, and given to a people. And not that I'm against you. You can also be part of that people. You Jews, you people of national Israel, you can also be part of the people. What should you do? Repent and come to me and receive the Holy Spirit and become and 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 be part of the, the global church, which is which has people from India. And people from Indiana in the U.S., people from Boston, people from Bangalore, people from Bolivia, people from Bahrain, people from all over the world. So this is what Jesus said. And what did the apostles say? They said a number of things. There are so many scriptures uh, that we can read, but you need to just have, quickly read all the chapters of Galatians. Okay, let me open my Bible to Galatians. Uh, Galatians. Apostle Paul's letter to Galatians, where he talks about this so often. Okay. Uh, Galatians. Okay, five chapters here. Okay, here, okay, it talks about uh, uh, Hagar and Sarah. Chapter 20, 421 to 431. Okay, 420, 21 to 31, and the last verse. Okay, uh, Galatians 431. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. Okay, so using the analogy of Hagar and Sarah, God says we are all children of. Sarah and Sarah was the whose was who was uh, Sarah's husband? Who? Abraham. Abraham. So we are all children of Abraham. He's talk, He's writing this to the all the believers of the Galatian church, okay? And he says, uh, okay, verse the end of verse chapter three, verse twenty nine. If you belong to Christ, chapter three, verse twenty nine, Galatians, then you are. Abraham's seed. So did he say, if you belong to Christ and, and if you are born to a Jewish father and Jewish mother, then you belong to Christ? Then you are Abraham's seed? No. If you belong to Christ, that means if you come to a faith in Jesus, if you repent from your sin and you put your faith in Jesus, you are Abraham's seed. You are national Israel in the eyes of God. So when God has said that, why do we focus on literal national Israel? 
it is a violation of scripture you know they this group uh, encourages people to celebrate passover uh, this group encourages people to buy land in israel because god has blessed that land literal land of israel so invest in a property you want to buy land you buy in usa or israel you buy in bahrain or dubai you can buy land anywhere but don't quote bible for it for your convenience to build a house you buy land anywhere if you have the money you buy it but don't quote bible for it if you want to uh, you know if you want to celebrate the passover you celebrate but don't attach any spiritual meaning to it because the new testament doesn't call you to you know it's not a sin to celebrate a passover okay just as it's not maybe during uh, uh, pongal time i uh, i i i don't mind saying happy pongal because it's a harvest festival different cultures have harvest festival and tamil culture has malayalam culture has kannada culture has uh, so uh, i thank god for for the harvest that he gives me and different cultures uh, you know though i don't acknowledge their god as the true god i acknowledge i while i don't compromise on the uniqueness of jesus uh and uh the uniqueness of yahweh and the uniqueness of the holy spirit holy spirit i don't compromise the uniqueness of the trinity and i don't mind celebrating a harvest festival so you want to celebrate passover as uh, one of the festivals that doesn't do any violence uh, to the uniqueness of trinity you can you can you can you can celebrate you can go and live in a tent and celebrate the uh, tabernacles and you can stress that uh, we are all transient to this world and that was a focus of this tent uh, the the festival of tents all that is fine you can do that but don't teach it as a doctrine because we are, the new testament doesn't call us to do any of that so uh, we must be very clear so when when the when this psalm says pray for this peace of jerusalem we need to take the counsel in the light of the entire bible rest of the bible so what does the new testament say the new testament says we must pray for Jeru uh, jerusalem and also for jeda also for Jai Salmer, also for any other city in the world. Why? Why do I say that? Uh, First Timothy chapter two. What should we pray for as New Testament believers? First Timothy chapter two. Let's look at that. Uh, First Timothy chapter two and verse one. Okay, as New Testament believers, what should we do? First Timothy chapter two, verse one. I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving made, be made for all people. So we pray for our brothers in Turkey reeling after that earthquake. Second earthquake also hit. 45,000, 50,000 people dead. Turkey and the neighboring country, Syria. Be intercessions be made for all people, not just for Jerusalem. Jerusalem also we can pray. But not just for Jerusalem. For kings, not just for the, the land, but also for the, the prime minister, the cabinet ministers, the queen, the kings, and all those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God, our Savior. First Timothy chapter 2 is very clear. So as New Testament, the early church did not have special prayer only to pray for the Jews. They prayed for everybody. Paul counsels them to pray for the salvation of everybody because everyone, God's will is that none should perish, but all will come to repentance. 2 Peter 3.9 So this moment, this Jewish, hyper-Jewish moment, hyper-Jewish moment, is again a very dangerous moment which and if you find people like that and they give they quote some scriptures you can be sure they're twisting some scriptures to uh to divert your attention uh so be wary of them be wary of hyper jewish cult the hyper jewish cult uh, and you must be uh and you must also show the show them these scriptures and not just the scriptures that show them that the thrust of the new testament is as the new testament you know, as we finish the book of Acts and then as we read about Cornelius and then as we come to Romans and come all the way to Revelation, the thrust is that the thrust is that we have to go and preach the gospel to everyone and not focus on any particular uh, one particular group. Uh, you know, we need to just go and get the gospel to everyone. All right. OK, thank you. Thank you for that. Amen. Uh, Brother Chandra Sega. OK, thank you so much. brother. Welcome.
Okay, question tells French truthfully, 942, my uh, laptop says. Uh, who's got the next question? Uncle. Yes, yes, uncle, yes. Uncle, I had a question that uh, how to interpret uh, 1 Timothy 2.12. 1 Timothy 2.12. Okay, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me worthy appointing me to be servant. Okay. Is that the verse? 1 Timothy 2.12? No, oh. Oh, sorry, yeah. that's 112. Uh, yeah. uh, 212. Okay. Uh, I, okay, I guess so. It must be something related with women. Okay, uh, 1 Timothy 2.12, I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet, 1 Timothy 2.12, for Adam was formed first and then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived, but it was a woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But woman will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Okay, this is one of the most controversial uh, passages in the New Testament. And you have, in fact, uh, as a recommendation, uh, there are books that you should order in your library and Jaziel has won several quizzes uh, that we have conducted. And in fact, he was the winner in the Song of Songs cover quiz as well. So he won another study Bible. Uh, you know, but there are, uh, while there are, while it's good to look at study Bibles, there are also uh, good books that particularly address difficult passages in the Bible. In fact, uh, I was reading an article recently which gave an award to to the best books released in the year 2022. Okay. Uh, this award was given in the US. And uh, and one of those books, I've, I'm not able to remember the name, but I took a screenshot because I wanted to buy that book. Uh, I get a copy of that book. I, again, It the, that book just does that, takes all these controversial passages and gives an explanation. Not just this passage, there's a passage in the Old Testament which says, uh, God told Joshua to kill entire families, including kids, and so on and so forth. I have addressed those that question as well. So, that, so there are Bible scholars who dedicate the time just to answer these kind of questions. But I'm glad you asked. Let me quickly give you a brief response. Now, uh, so when when we see that uh, Paul making statements like this, um, we have to ask how did Paul practice the theology that he is promoting here. So when we look at what he practiced, then we come to our understanding of what he really taught. Okay? So we need to go observe his practice and then cycle back, reverse back. And I heard these automatic uh, electric scooters you know, I read some ads uh, for them and they say that in petrol bike, you can't come back. With the, but in, uh, in electric scooter, you can, with, the, with, the, with, with the some gear, and gear change, you can come back. Uh, you can come back. So you, can, you cycle back or you come back and you, uh, then you look at this passage. So what did he practice? Now, Apostle Paul talks about women who were active in ministry, even the teaching ministry. It's observed, we can, we can safely say that based on many letters. Okay, let me give you uh, one example. Go with me to Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. Romans, the last chapter. Okay. Uh, there are a number of names there. Okay. It says, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in 
Christ, they risked their lives for me. Not only uh, I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. And if you carefully read the references of Paul to Priscilla and Aquila, he'll always mention Priscilla first. And based on these references and number of other and a few other points, people have clearly said that Priscilla's role in that church that met there was that of a teaching role. Okay. Why? Because not just Paul. In Acts, with the book of Acts, which was written by Luke under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Okay, in chapter 2, verse 17, we read, in Luke chapter 2, verse 17, we read, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. So Luke and understanding based on uh, Old Testament uh, uh, reference, which was fulfilled when the coming of the Holy Spirit came, what is it? What is it? The Bible, what is it? The Bible talking about sons and daughters. So it's not talking about only sons will prophesy. What is prophesy? Prophesy is proclaiming the word of God under the power of the Holy Spirit. In one sense, I'm also prophesying because I am listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, however imperfectly, but listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit and answering the questions that you're asking me. Uh, so it. I, I, when I share a message, this Sunday I preached in a church uh, uh, and my preparation for the quiz helped me. But I sat and asked God to speak to me. I spoke from the Shulamite woman to the congregation I preached to by, by invitation this Sunday. Uh, a message for church believers, a message for single people, and a message for, church, uh, message for married couples in that church. All starting with the Shulamite woman of Song of Songs, uh, a message of around 30, 40 minutes. I just uh, made that public on my YouTube. So uh, Luke clearly says sons and daughters will prophesy. And here we have uh, a reference to Priscilla mentioned first. Not just that, you have, uh, you have other cases of, there's one woman apostle. Uh, I'm just trying to get her name. Uh, okay, maybe she that is there in chapter 16, but there's also a woman apostle named. Uh, and who is an apostle? An apostle is someone who goes to a place, okay, and proclaims the gospel. And she's a, a woman apostle is named. You know, people who try to uh, say women can't preach, try to say that that name is not a name of the woman, and they try to uh, have a lot of words about that but when you look read the name it's obvious it's the name of a woman I, you know i'm not able to get the name immediately but there's a woman apostle name and the, the prominence of uh, Priscilla. so there's and you cross over and you come to jesus okay and jesus in revelation chapter two so if jesus had a big problem with jezebel i just read that scripture revelation chapter 2 20 to 22 so Jesus had an excellent opportunity there in Revelation chapter 2 to say, you know, the, which church encouraged Jezebel? Uh, Thyatira. So Revelation chapter 2, 20 onwards. Jesus could have said, Thyatira, I have a problem with you, Thyatira. Okay. Problem is, first of all, you are not supposed to allow a woman to preach. But you allowed a woman to preach. Second problem is that woman is teaching false teaching. But Jesus doesn't address anything about the fact that she's a woman, but Jesus is concerned about the false teaching that Jezebel taught or someone like a Jezebel, a, a New Testament Jezebel, who had a theology like the Old Testament Jezebel, who made people comfortable in sin. So Jesus comes against her strongly in Revelation chapter 2. So Luke, Apostle Paul, and Jesus all in their ministry. In fact, Jesus also had women who would, who would travel with him in his ministry team. So all had women in, in 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 the in their ministry and and the word prophet sons and daughters will prophesy indicates god has given permission for women to prophesy and proclaim god's word so how do you understand first timothy chapter 2 and what we read how do we understand it it's very simple in that church 
there were some problematic women and Paul is addressing this passage to them. Okay. So what he's trying to say is, okay, in that, in that particular context, okay, in that, in that particular context, you don't, uh, you don't, you don't allow those problematic women to speak. So that is how we learn to interpret scripture. So, because if Paul really believed that women should not preach, then all the other references about women being a, a, one, a woman being an apostle and and and, and uh, also uh, sons and daughters uh, prophesying, those references will not will 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 not be there. So, from the practice, you back up your theology, and that is how what I tell. When we speak about hypergrace, also that's what we say. So there's no, there's no reference in the entire Bible when, when, of people of of the apostles ever saying to the believers, "Okay, if you have sinned, you know, Jesus smiles at you. You know, don't worry. Uh, uh, you know, relax." But always you'll find when people sin, the apostles are calling them to repent. And in some cases, as we see in Acts, the book of Acts. They are warning them, you know, apostles under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit says, if you uh, repent of this, lest something worse will happen. Like the one Simon the sorcerer became blind, you know. So this is the, the, the most severe warning. Jesus himself told the, uh, the woman who repented, who was caught in adultery, whom he, 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 he didn't allow the stoning of her. But then he said, leave your life of sin. So what, this is the thrust of the apostles. So you come to the practice, you see how a certain thing is practiced, and then you I interpret the theology passages. Uh, well, I have not covered many things. In, uh, and again, there is a book, uh, there's another series in my library, which is called Two Views, Three Views, Four Views, Views series. I can send you a picture, uh, send a picture of that uh, to you, Jaziel, and any others who want it. Uh, there are about seven or eight books from that series I have. So all of this talks about different views that the church has on Tony subjects, on the second coming, on the rapture, on women in ministry. So, but, okay, so these problems, these passages have been really problematic. I understand that. But I believe much of the problem starts when we try to make a doctrine just based on that teaching passage instead of going to the testimony. And I also sent up, I did a poster recently uh, that poster is from Isaiah 8.20. Okay, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20, the post, uh, what, uh, how do we formulate doctrine? We need two things for doctrine. Isaiah 8.20, consult God's instruction or teaching. Okay, consult Isaiah 8.20 and testimony of the warning. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no dawn. Isaiah 8.20 is an excellent passage on how to formulate doctrine. We need teaching and we need testimony. So just with teaching, you cannot formulate a doctrine. Just because Paul said it appears on the face value, women should not preach. You have to go and see the testament. Has Paul allowed women to preach in his ministry? The evidence is there. Has other apostles allowed? Have they allowed? The evidence is there. Did Jesus, uh, in the book of Revelation, uh, the risen Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, did he have any problem you know, of, of any woman preaching did he did he make a note no on rather the thrust is if women preach they need to preach the right doctrine if women preach they need to preach in a way that they that they that they that they don't violate the other things that god wants in order in the church and here in that in this context something seriously is wrong okay that that's another study but in that context, something seriously wrong. So that is why this, this, this command has come. Uh, and also here Paul speaks about, uh, uh, so Paul looks like it. Paul puts down men here, uh, sorry, puts down women here. But if you carefully see, there are other places where Paul puts down men. Here it looks like Paul puts down women. But there are other places, uh, I can give you the references later on, where Paul seems to put down men. So it's balanced. Here it looks like he puts down women. A woman was deceived first and so on and so forth. 
but there are other places in his own writings where Paul puts it on men. So it's, it's balanced. So we still believe, we believe Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So here, to emphasize something, Paul did this. There to emphasize something else, Paul did that. So I will give you the reference for that. Where, where Paul strongly comes against men. Okay, Paul comes against uh, Adam. And here he seems to come against Eve. So depending on the context, Paul will use different characters to teach doctrine. So here the best, uh, the, the most uh, convincing Bible scholars tell us that there is a unique problem going on in Timothy, in that situation which Timothy is in, uh, which made Paul say that. So the, the effective message is women who teach false teaching or women uh, whose life does not back the gospel message uh, should not be preaching at all. And that is true for men as well. That is true for everyone. So it's not a tirade against women. Okay. I know that's a little long, longish answer, but uh, I just wanted to also explain how doctrine is formed. So you come from the testimony and you go to the teaching. And once you have teaching and then the testimony, then you formulate doctrine. So if you only have teaching and there's no testimony to it, then you can't make that as a doctrine. Okay. Uh, 958. Priscilla to everyone. Uh, uh, Jaziel, I hope my answer was useful. I uh, I, I did sound a little long-winded. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Welcome, welcome, Jaziel. There's. I also have answered this briefly in two or three minutes on YouTube. I can send you that link in three, four minutes. Um, I, in a Bible study, I answered this question in three or four minutes. And this, I must have done it much longer. Uh, but there I've given more relevant, uh, some other references which I might have missed uh, when I talked here. Okay, uh, there's a common question on whether Christians can listen to secular music. Uh, Priscilla, Paul, to everyone. What's your advice on young worship leaders who draw boundaries and discern between the type of music we Christians can enjoy? Okay. Uh, I believe the uh, the direct reference for this, uh, when it comes to the type of music that we can enjoy, uh, though we, those some of us coming from conservative church backgrounds, want to look for a verse in the Bible: "Thou shalt not listen to secular music." We are looking to find a verse like that in the in the New Testament: "Thou shalt not listen to secular music." But there's no verse like that. But rather, there are principles that guides us on our choice of music. Okay. Uh, what's that principle? Come with me to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Okay. Verse Eight. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So this scripture uh, does not say whatever is true but Christian, whatever is noble but Christian, Whatever is right but Christian, whatever is pure but Christian, it just says whatever. It doesn't say uh, whatever is Christian, whatever is produced only by Christian belief. You know, the word whatever is used. So some Bible scholars, and I do agree with them to a great extent, say it is not wrong to listen to clean secular music. Okay. Clean secular music, words that don't call for sex before marriage, words that don't call for sexual kissing between couples, clean love songs, and, and so on and so forth. Again, but this is again um, an area where in which Christians are massively divided. Uh, and again, I would like to tell uh, young people, you know, you should, if your pastor preaches hyper grace and those kind of teachings, you can have a, uh, you can have a, 
conversation with him and uh, an, an argument with him uh, down the line saying that what he's doing is wrong. But these matters, if your pastor says, don't listen to secular music, don't go into a war with them because this is not worth fighting. These are not major differences uh, which, will, uh, which will take you to hell. Uh, these are, uh, I would place them under minor category. So you, if, if what I say contradicts with what your Christian leader of prominent influence says, don't go out for a war with him. You know, I want to tell you Christians are divine. So, so that, that, that's the thing. So it's, and also, when you look at the ministry of Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 17, okay, how did he do ministry? When he's standing in Athens and preaching the gospel to a pagan culture, he says, one of your own poets says, we are the offspring of God. So how did Paul know about that? Acts chapter 17, uh, uh, Acts chapter 17, if you start reading his speech in Athens, which starts in verse 22, okay, he says uh, in verse 28, for in him, 1728, for in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, your own poets have said, which means these are secular poets. So Paul is familiar with the writings of some of the secular poets who were very popular at that time. I'm sure they were not pornographic because Paul warns against lust so many times in his writings. But these are clean writings. Maybe he didn't agree with everything. Many of the secular writings will say all religions are basically the same. Paul disagreed with such writings because he said there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He never compromised on, uh, uh, on, on the doctrine of uh, uh, uniqueness of Jesus. But he was familiar with the writings of the secular people. So, which means I could look at the lyrics of a secular song and, and contrast it with the gospel or use it to complement the gospel. See, tomorrow, God willing, I'm going to speak to an audience of students and they might be from different faiths. And my topic is exam preparation and career success, but I'm going to bring in the gospel. And in my message, I've got a lot of secular illustrations. I have quotes from some movie stars. I'm quoting a song sung by actor Vijay, who's popular in South India, where he talks about self-motivation and so on and so forth. I and mean, I'm not, uh, I, it's there in my notes. I'm not able to remember it. I, I'm talking about what Surya, actor Surya said about cell phone addiction and when he spoke to our student audience. Do I agree with everything that he said? Absolutely not. In fact, elsewhere I've contradicted what Surya, what came in a Surya movie where a child sings a pluralistic song and the words were written by a popular Tamil movie uh, lyricist, uh, Vairamuthu though the singer was uh, uh, was actually a Christian by name, Harris Jairaj's daughter, not related to me, but Harris Jairaj's daughter. Uh, uh, in fact, I talked about that in my message to uh, the youth of Ananagar Methodist uh, on January 26th. So I, sometimes we contradict what Christian theology or the gospel says in connection with the song. Sometimes they complement do we need self-motivation as uh, one of the songs of Vijay in the movie Master says we need self-motivation? Yes, the Bible does talk about self-motivation. Self-motivation cannot save you, but the Bible does talk about self-motivation. In fact, uh, it does so in Proverbs chapter 6, where it talks about the ant. Proverbs 6, 6 onwards, ants, they go about doing their work without a leader. They are self-motivated. But can self-motivation save you? Absolutely not. And if you listen to some of the interviews of Vijay, he says he goes to, those from a Christian family, he goes to a, a Hindu temple, he goes to a Muslim uh, mosque, and he goes to, a, uh, you know, goes to every place of worship, wherever he is. And if he's in a shooting spot and there's a religious place, he likes to go there. He's a pluralist. Is pluralism wrong? Absolutely. Is Vijay wrong there? Absolutely. So you know where to quote, to complement and where to contrast. 
So I am of the opinion. In fact, our we our ministry uh, is based on two passages: Luke chapter thirteen, uh, where Jesus wraps the message of repentance around two contemporary events of his time: a tower crash, eighteen people die. A evil ruler butchers people and mixes their blood in a sacrifice. Two horrific events. Two events that grabbed eyeballs. Okay, but Jesus wraps message of repentance around it. Luke 13, 1 to 5. And then this very passage. Luke Acts 17, where Paul preaches the gospel, but he wraps it around a secular court. So our ministry spends a lot of time doing that. Uh, in my book, Good News for the Google Generation, which some of you have read, has entire chapters on doing the same thing, you know, good news for the Google generation. Uh, so we must do that instead of saying that I'm not going to go anywhere near it. But what is pornographic, what is filthy, we reject outrightly because for obvious reasons. Uh, 2 Samuel 11, 27, the thing that David did displeased the Lord, uh, a verse against a pawn watching and so on and so forth. Okay, thank you. I can answer one more question. And I think we should be done. Uh, what advice for single people who are awaiting God's call for marriage? Few principles to keep in mind for a successful marriage. Uh, Priscilla, Paul, everyone, thank you for that question, Priscilla. Uh, single people awaiting God's call for marriage. Uh, uh, you know, one thing that many single people uh, want. You know, they they are they are waiting for God's will in marriage it's fine okay but uh and that's a big subject but what i want you to understand is uh god wants you to choose your life part and that's very very clear and i want to just show that scripture very strongly the choice is yours okay god will help you with the choice but he still will say you need to make a choice I won't make the choice for you. I know that sounds very spiritual. God, you choose a life partner for me. God says, sorry, sorry, I can't choose a life partner for you. You will do the choosing. Don't fall off your seats because that's what the Bible says. First Corinthians 7, 39. First Corinthians, a woman is bound to her husband as long as she lives. But if her husband dies, and then that means she becomes single. And all of us, there are many single people here. Uh, Kevin, you're single. I know that. Uh, Jazzy, you're single. You're, I, I, know, I know that. Okay. Okay. Uh, and if you're if you're single, okay, the if a husband dies, then if you become if you're single, what should you do? First Corinthians seven thirty nine. You are free to marry anyone. It doesn't say free to you. You are literally God says you're free to marry anyone. You God has given you free will. You can marry anyone, but there's only one condition. What's one What's one condition? But the person you marry must belong to the Lord. You must marry a believer. So it's very simple. Choosing a life partner is very simple. You can technically marry any believer. So we try to complicate it. Yes, we must uh, spend some time in God's presence. That's, that's helpful uh, because Jesus did that. Even when he chose 12 disciples, he spent the entire night praying to God. Luke chapter 6, 12. Okay, uh, and 13, Luke chapter 6, verse 12, he spent the entire night praying to God. And the next day morning, Jesus told, chose 12 uh, disciples. So that, that's helpful. But again, you will choose. So God will, uh, God, you know, uh, you know, puts desires in your heart. God takes away desires in your heart. And then the person you marry, as Amos chapter 3, verse 3 says, uh, must have a similar goal to you like you like you can two people walk together unless they are agreed so if you want to serve jesus full time you must marry someone who agrees with that dream of yours or who will complement that dream of yours that's the only thing that got me and my wife together because otherwise we are poles apart we belong to a different caste to start with and my caste is notorious for marrying only within itself uh, and it, so it's 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 not easy for a person like me to marry a a, a, a girl like Ivan or for a girl like Ivan to marry a, a guy like Duke. But God brought us together. Why? Because we all had we had one similarity. I 
committed for full time ministry when i was very young at the age of 13 in a in a in a blessing youth mission camp and she when her when a preacher came to her school when she was studying in boarding school because our parents were missionaries in in interior parts of orissa she committed for ministry and when we conversed with each other when i came to work in chennai after finishing my agriculture engineering course in 1997 I worked here for a few months before going to Bible college in 98, uh, June, uh, 97, September, I finished. A uh, few months I worked here. That's when I met her in a fellowship, uh, which was called Students for Jesus. Uh, that fellowship took place in a home in Nungambakam. Mm, that's when I met. So then that's when I realized, I mean, when I started talking to her, then I realized this girl is committed for ministry when she was in school itself. And that's what brought us together. I just a few months out after I finished my BTEC agriculture engineering and she at that time was already working in a hospital in Chennai. So we worked, uh, then we talked and then ultimately the elders got together and we got married and we have been married for now uh, 22 years. In 2001, we got married. So that's how you choose your life partner, a believer with a similar goal. But if your plan is you'll have a corporate job, you'll have a government job, and you'll have a teaching job, then you'll do ministry. Find out somebody like that. For me, the call was clearly full-time ministry. At the age of 13, I committed to full-time ministry. So I needed to find out somebody like that because so that so that we'll have we'll have that sync. Can two people walk together unless they are agreed? No? Amos 3:3. So, and then what are the things that you need to keep in mind for a successful marriage? Selflessness. That's stressed in Genesis 24. The girl who's going to marry my master's son will not only give me water, but also my master's camel's water. Not only, and camels drink a lot of water, which means, is she a giver? So if you're a good giver, then your, your good marriage material, number one. Second, your marriage will also work. Because marriage is, is a, actually a game, uh, a contest that you have with your life, life partner, wherein you compete with each other to be who is going to be more sacrificial. As a husband, I should think, how can I be more sacrificial? I might have done a cutie cutie for one hour, 15 minutes, but if my wife has a leg pain tonight, I will press her legs for one hour. I don't, and I don't think I've done something great because I'm always thinking at every hour of my marriage, how can I be selfless? And she's also thinking, how can I be selfless and serve my husband? So we are having a competition. Who's going to be more selfless? So that makes a good marriage. A good marriage will also have fights as we have as a Song of Songs couple in chapter five, they have a fight. The husband goes out for work and and he comes back and he knocks the door. Wife doesn't want to get up and open the door. She thinks that distance from our bed to the door is like Kashmir to Kanyakumari. So she doesn't want to open the door. She gives some excuse. And by the time she op opens the door, husband is short-tempered. Wife is lazy. Husband is short-tempered. He's gone off somewhere. But then quickly they make up because in chapter 7 again, they are making love to each other. 5, they are fighting. 7, they are making love. Song of Songs 5, they are fighting. Song of Songs 7, they are making love. Which means in marriage, you will have fights. And that's allowed over minor things. But you know, you, when you have God as the center of your marriage, your marriage will prosper, will thrive. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, uh, we are finished now. And I'm going to pray and close. Thank you for joining us. And uh, I just want to uh, make sure that I, uh, I get... Uh, uh, so, Ruben, right now, are you? Where are you joining us from? Ruben, are you there? Are you joining us from Singapore? Are you... Okay. Sam, joining us from Chennai. Correct me if I'm wrong. John, joining us from Mumbai. Chandrasekhar, joining us from Hyderabad. Are you? Where you yes, based? Sir. Hyderabad. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Vinolia, where are you joining us from? From Musket. From Musket. Okay. Oman. Okay. What do you do? Yeah, in from... You work or you're a student? 
No, actually, I'm with my husband. Actually, I'm a nurse. I studied in CMC. So from there, I got this connection. Now I'm in Oman with my husband. Okay. God bless you. I'm not family. working. Okay, God bless your family. Thank you for joining us from Oman. Uh, Jaziel joining. Uh, Jaziel, where are you? Uh, here in... Yeah? Okay, okay. Uh, give me the name of the place again. Chidambaram. Chidambaram. Okay, Chidambaram in Tamil Nadu. God bless you, Jaziel. Uh, and we have Jacobson. Jacobson, where are you joining us from, sir? Anna, joining from uh, Chennai, Perambur. Okay. And uh, which, uh, what do you do, Jacobson? Uh, I, my full name is Peniel Jacobson, Anna. You spoke to oh, me. Okay, okay. C congrats on the arrival of the baby Thank boy. You. Yes, okay. yes. Thank you. God bless him. And I'm, I'm encouraged that. Uh, despite all your multiple responsibilities, you tune in for this program, and uh, I, I'm so encouraged. Uh, Priscilla, uh, where are you joining us from? Uh, hi, I'm actually from, I'm a resident from Hyderabad, but I'm a student studying in Ahmedabad right now. Ahmedabad, Gujarat? Yes. Okay, okay. W what line of study? I'm pursuing my master's in urban management. Okay. Hotel management? Urban management. Urban I'm an architect by okay. profession. Now I'm doing urban management. Okay. Okay. Great. Wonderful. Uh, happy to have someone joining us from Gujarat. Dayakar joining us from Hyderabad. No, yes. I am from Israel. I moved to Israel a year ago. Okay. Okay. But you're the Dayakar from Emmanuel House of Worship, right? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Yes. You're right. You invited me for Emmanuel House of Worship program. I remember. You work in Israel now? Yes, Anna. Okay, wonderful. Okay. Okay. God bless you. Uh, okay. Joining us from Israel. Um, Suma joining us from, uh, remind me, Suma, you're joining us from Vizak? Vizak, yes. Yes. Uh, doctor, uh, finished doc, you, you're in the final year? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Just results came out yesterday. Wonderful. Congrats. Congrats. Thank you. <laughs> so for PG. And Vineet joining us from Hyderabad, right? Hyderabad. Yes. Okay. Congrats. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Happy to have all of you. Let me just uh, offer a brief word of prayer. Lord, I thank you for each one who's joined. Uh, they have so many challenges, uh, but they have joined and they are a big encouragement to me. I, I thank you for them. Uh, my answers are not perfect. They are not exhaustive. They are, uh, they point to something, but they give scope for some homework to be done. Um, but thank you for their patience and listening to each of these answers and bless each one by name. And I pray that you'll make them a blessing uh, to those of us in India. Let us be a blessing to our nation. Uh, Lord, uh, let uh, Vinolo, Vinoli and our family to be a blessing to Oman and Dayakar a blessing to Israel. And, and we'll be a blessing to the nations. For your promise in Genesis chapter 12, I'll bless you and through your families, I will bless the earth. Lord, we thank you for that promise. And we pray that you'll continue to guide us till we meet again, God willing, next time. In Jesus Christ, my prayer. Amen. A quick announcement. Uh, these three books, I will be able to send it to you for 500 if you have not received it. Uh, Straight Talk. Uh, this is the third edition of Straight Talk. Uh, first edition was in 2010. God willing, this year I will do the fourth edition. I'm working on it, but this book is available. Uh, 50 chapters, uh, taboo topics covered, porn, uh, so many to topics. Uh, sex inside of marriage. Uh, if believer and sin, if I, a uh, lot of questions on uh, what the believer's relationship with sin. So many different topics are covered for uh, sex, love, marriage, porn, phone addiction. So this book. Straight talk, and then good news of Google generation helps you to share the gospel with uh, your co contemporaries. Uh, and also, Daniel and Dell is a Bible study, chapter by chapter, Bible study on Daniel. Daniel talks about Antichrist. This book also talks about the Antichrist. Daniel also focuses on small group fellowships. It also tells you, gives you a blow by blow account on how to start small group fellowship. Reach out to me over WhatsApp. Uh, these three books can be sent to you for 500 rupees. Okay, God bless. Until we meet again, may God be with you. And I will keep you posted about our next event. Uh, uh, 
Uh, we are in the final stages of our mag. It's taking some time, but we are, uh, our designer is working on the final edition of the mag. So another few days, maybe 15, 20 days, it will see the light of day. You'll receive the PDF. And I will be able to send you the print copy of the magazine, The Days of Your Youth as well. Okay, God bless and you all take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, brother. Bye. Good night.